Hello everyone, welcome to my channel again. Um, thank you for stopping by. Um, for those that you don't who don't know me, my name is Henry Haight. I am an artist and um, I spend my time between London, England and here in California. Um, right now, uh, I am quite busy with, I've just wrapped up a show uh, where I'm doing an artist, artist in residency in London, England at the Huxley. And if you're in the vicinity, it is running till July 22nd um, for Pride Month, which I'm very honored to uh, do and represent. Represent. Uh, it is a big honor. Um, and uh, a lot of planning went into this. And um, curating and editing show can be very stressful because you want the works to, to flow, tell a story, as well as have impact to a room to uh, get the viewer interested in your body of work. Um, now that that's in the can, I'm now in the middle of uh, editing and building a new show for my first in Los Angeles in nearly almost three decades. At Laura Powell Projects. I will leave a link uh, with the information of that show in September, which I'm very excited to be a part of and do. Laura, new rule. Um, but today's uh, topic is going to be uh, one that has been very uh, apparent to me during this whole process for my Los Angeles show, and that is the anatomy of a painting. Now, when I talk about the anatomy of painting, I'm talking about the all-encompassing of the, the creative process of making a work uh, through, th through whatever theme. However, you are with this blank canvas, this inanimate object, and you're trying to create or start a dialogue of visual language. And essentially, there is a process and a structure to approach this. And the weird thing is, uh, I remember uh, one of my favorite artists, Mark Bradford, said um, in a video that um, he found certain works very, very difficult and others very, very easy. And um, if you can have a look here. My life action is exactly like my paintings. You know, it's, it's lots and lots of layers and you'll get a little bit of... Some, something will peek in from the underneath that kind of just peeks out and lets you know that there's a little bit more going on than you thought. I'm not going to give you the whole thing. Just give you a little bit. No need to have the whole thing because I'm not even sure what the whole thing is. Just, you know. People have often asked me, how do you know when a work is done? A, real, a work is simply, a, you enter into a very intense relationship with something. And you go through every single thing with that thing, whether it's a thought, whether it's it's an actual object, and it's very intimate, it's spatial, it um, has all these different components, but you know when it's over. I mean, everyone knows when a relationship is over. It's simple, it's the same thing with the, with the work. So, um, within the anatomy of painting, it's what is the guide and what is the structure and process of how you want to get the desired result? And the first, th uh, one obviously is going to be your theme and subject matter. What is it that you want to convey or say and what is it that you want to emulate out to the world? Um, you're birthing something again from a blank canvas or if you have this idea of something normally I tend to like jot down things or take photos or, or like uh, things on my phone or I'll make voice memos to remind me of so I get an idea and I'm like ah um, and uh, because my, my head is always clicking, like, to, what, what am I going to do? What am I gonna, what am I gonna, how am I going to work this out? Um, but it, and normally, is it running with the, theme, the course of themes that I already have in my body of work? If it's a yes, then okay. Um, if it's no, mm, I'll put that on the back burner. Number one is theme and subject matter. What is the story of your work? What, what, why is it that you're doing this piece? What is it about this 
piece that's so significant that you have to put it onto a blank canvas and, and, and give it to the world. It sounds quite arrogant to say that, but when you create a work, you're not creating body work just to, or a painting to virtually tuck into um, you know, the, the corner of your closet. No one joins a band for obscurity. You know, everyone wants the hope of kind of getting some sort of glory or recognition for the work or their, their talents. So again, your theme and subject matter, how is it that you want the viewer to respond to your work is crucial when you're asking yourself before you, you approach this painting. How am I going to say this and how do I want to make them feel in, in the theme and subject matter of my work that I'm trying to create? Number one. Secondly, is what style and technique are you going to do this in? Or what school of, of training? You know, you can do classical, you can do expressionist, you're going to do, you know, abstract, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. But the whole thing is that how, you, how does the theme and subject matter correlate to the, the technique and style that you're going to, to create within this is, is, is another one. Um, for me, uh, I try to stick within four, because I'm a multidisciplinary, um, I tend to go towards paintings of more of the expressive, uh, layer impostoed uh, effect, single studies, um, sometimes erotic art. Um, you know, one of my galleries called me uh, NC-17 artist, which I kind of like, but <laughs> anyways. But you know, the, the whole thing is that when I, when I create a piece, I always think of the original of, of the themes of where I'm getting my influences from. Where are you basing your influences on this technique from? What are the artists that you're, you virtually, uh, that influence your work as well as, do they have some more themes to yours? Um, that is a crucial thing. Uh, some of the artists that I truly, truly love and admire and respect, Andy Warhol, Richard Prince. Um, Andy Warhol is quite specific with silk screening. He didn't do, you know, painting in the classical sense, but to him, painting was the form of silk screening, and he still called those paintings, uh, paintings rather than prints. Um, you know, when I make prints, I silk screen or do digital, but when I paint, I will paint. Uh, but when I silk screen on a canvas, it is technically called a painting. But, you know, what school of technique and training and influence are you trying to put into that? Because as an artist, you're standing on the shoulders of giants and the masters that came before you. And essentially, the work should have a, a what I call a bloodline of creativity who, who became before you, la, 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 la. And then therefore, you can see a transition of a narrative from from this theme and subject matter so people go ah a fresh new perspective that is what i'm talking about with your anatomy of your painting uh, next up is color palette and mediums are you using oils are you using oil pastels what you know using mud um i know karn griffith he likes to use tea bags in painting his works and you know he does beautiful uh, color washes and paintings with uh using tea uh you know yay caffeine um but again you you have to figure out your color palette and your you know your uh, mediums is are you using oils are you going to mix these two sometimes if i'm using oils i stick just just to oils if i'm using acrylics i like to virtually do the acrylics and then put um a color uh, oil glazing over my oil painting uh, my uh, acrylic paintings um you know or add uh, gold sizing and leafing gold gilding to my work uh and for more impact and again the running theme of a lot of my work so that when i see shows i want everything to be a, not a uniformity of just creating the same the same work but i want to see a running theme and a running color pot with stuff so people go oh, okay i get this but that is when you actually start looking at this and you know if you're just doing a one-off that's great and stuff but essentially you are creating a, um, a piece that you're going to have to figure out which mediums what you know what what are you going to put to 
to canvas are you using acrylics are you going to do mixed media collage what so that is the second thing of, with the theme and it's true that that you know be a a professional artist to a starting artist everyone has that process journey of like is this working is this like you you're trying to like interact with your eye and your stomach your gut your gut instinct to is this how i want it to work and i'll be honest sometimes the paintings come to me very very some paintings come to be very easy and others um in fragments because it if i explain it when i'm studying ah, crazy um for me certain paintings or if i get an idea i almost feel like a rumble in my tummy and i can see the visuals and the the theme the subject matter colors hues and the influences of where I'm drawing these from. And then I can put them boom, 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 boom. And almost in harmony and in and, and a sequence that they they flow. And, and I get that one particular uh, image right. And other times, ugh, um, it's it's very difficult. And uh, it's it's a struggle because one, one brush stroke or one you know, wrong color can virtually set everything off and you find yourself in, in a road less traveled of what you're trying to convey and what you see in your head to what your hands and your eyes and your imagination are virtually saying this. And sometimes you kind of have to let the canvas take you where it wants to go and step back, look at it. And again, this is where you have a conversation with your eyes, your imagination and your gut instinct of what is the initial impact of this piece saying to you or where is it is it showing you where you need to go are you getting closer to it yada 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 so within this i'm going to give you the my tips and and uh itemizations list of the anatomy of a painting now sometimes the weird thing of i learned from one artist um that i uh, two artists actually um that i love that i find very uh that do this uh tama finland uh, George Petty and Alberto Fagas, um, which is called the overdraw. Um, or uh, when I uh, paint, I will tend to over paint things be, uh, proportionately just for impact because I want, for me, when I'm making a painting, I am creating a heightened sense of an alternate uh, reality of what I'm trying to paint. Um, you know, I, I, I approach realism, but I don't call it realism. Um, you know, some people go abstract realism, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, but I, I look at my work as more emotive in that sense because it's, um, I'm put, I paint people that I know I, uh, that have a personal connection to me and a, a story, their faces tell stories. Also, it's into my history with these people that virtually, um, it tells the story of how this work came about and you know sometimes you know but anyway i digress but the whole thing is that when i'm i'm creating the work you know i'm, I'm trying to train my eye to make sure that everything is proportionate and right now one of the paintings that i've had the hardest time with is trying to paint my friend segan and i took some photo studies of him and he was you know segan you rule uh but when I started to put the painting down, um, I got a three quarter angle from him because he's got this great profile and his eyebrow is his, his left eyebrow. Just, I couldn't get it right. And it's just like, who is this person? And the whole thing is that, you know, again, I, I still have to go by the classical format and foundational techniques, proportion and structure of trying to get these things. And when you're doing faces, you know, like they say, the windows are the eyes of the soul. And, you know, that is one of the first identical marks of a person is that when you see their eyes, you go, ah, oh, you know. Um, and essentially, you know, I tend to go through the George Petty, Tom and Phil, over, I'm not trying big penises, but I need to over overdraw or overpaint things to make an impact from, you know, five, six feet away, as opposed to right up close to the canvas. Um, that tends to help me in some senses because again you're creating you're trying to create a three-dimensional uh 
piece of work in a, a, a two-dimensional format, which can be very daunting because you're like, ah. but if you don't understand the foundations of, again, physicality, structure, composition, proportion, that it can it can be really daunting and you know one tip i always tell uh the artists that i've trained especially within tattooing if they want to learn a lot is if you sit here or sit with yourself for five minutes and draw your hand for two weeks five minutes a day just throw your hand down just like plop it and let it fall in different variations every day don't just sit it and just like but just throw your hand in a claw, do something, but put your phone, time yourself for five minutes, and that will actually get you to learn structure and composition and shapes of proportion and 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 design of how to actually navigate and draw anatomy. Because rather than thinking, okay, I'm drawing a hat, you're trying to give yourself and train your eye within five minutes to look at shapes, Format, structure, direction, all those things. And virtually, like, the, I tell my uh, my apprentices, you know, you like when the Terminator goes into the bar and starts scanning everybody's up. You need to do that within five minutes of your hand. You know, and that's a, a gift that virtually will save your ass. Um, I learned this in our school, actually in, in high school, um, one of my my teachers was like, Henry, just draw your hand. And he, we would do this for two weeks. And I learned it. And um, I never forgot that. So, Mr. Russell, thank you for that. So, um, this starts off with time how much time are you allowing yourself you know when i started uh early on um i was quite lazy and i just wanted i, I didn't want to work you know like five days of uh, three months on the paint you crazy just do it you know and no um you know but that, i was a young kid in, in art school and stuff and uh you know as I've become a lot more knowledgeable in my techniques and my um, my arsenal of tools, um, I then allow myself uh, to do that. The, uh, you know, with certain works, they they come quite easily, and I can I get it in my I get rumble in my tummy, and I can see it and put them all in the process, and ooh, done, perfect. Um, and others, it's it's a struggle, and sometimes I've had to put something away and leave it for a couple of weeks or you know um or so if i'm working the one piece right now I, I left and i was like no i don't i don't like the background i don't this is not working you know there's something it needs some something the structure's off you know the eye is not the eye is almost there um give yourself the time to just like give your eyes a rest um you know look at the composition shapes values contrast hues um those all will help within the building of these if you're if you're working with acrylics i would say start with the darkest and then build up within the lights and then virtually uh or take a bit of cardboard uh and cut out a square put it over the actual area you're trying to color match and look at just that color because what's going to happen that little color people is going to show you what that true color is as opposed to when you just look at a photo you're seeing reds blues greens and that can be overwhelming and then you know the, the overall composition could be you know more of an orangey amber hue but when you put off you block everything out with the little people you can see oh uh, that's ah uh, that's a purple so uh, that that's and you can start building within that that palette to virtually build within the structure of your painting. Um, they always talk about you know in like the National Geographic or Discovery Channel when they like look at masterworks and then they xerox uh, they X-ray them and you can see that they did something completely different underneath. That is what you're doing with your work right now. You could put some ugly mung you know 
wildebeest and you're trying to get some beautiful woman or guy or person mountain dog whatever um but it's just not coming it's just like this is like um you know that that you can build on top of it and cover it and edit it with your paintbrush this is where you virtually are learning those dynamics to virtually build on you know shapes that like you rather than erasing or coloring you're virtually using these paintbrushes um you know the knowledge of your paintbrushes what to use them um i used to start with like very big ones and then start with the smaller ones now i just kind of do like the structure block in the darker patterns and then build on top of that i i want to get the foundation of the composition of whatever i'm painting down first do the darks then build up on that, do the highlights, know where my direction of light with my hots and colds are. My hot, hot, dark parts um, are the easy. It's the light ones and then the hues of virtually the graduations. If you look at someone like um, Chuck Close and how he does his uh, color point portraits with the circular points as of like five, uh, the grids paintings of portraits where he'll use uh, five or six colors within one block to make a, a hue of one tone on a person um much like van gogh where he would do seven different stri uh, brush strokes to get one shade um the, the whole thing is that you're working with your color palette to do a trick of the light so trick of the light is going to take you time to virtually get that right and again that um <laughs> nothing worth ha nothing easily gained is worth having and you know these are the things um that art youtube is like hey you're yes you're learning the technique and it's one person's technique but the whole thing is that you're trying to learn your eye and your talent your 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 skill and your voice so you know you don't uh, so why do someone else's yes they can teach you you know how to like paint a seascape and stuff like that but you kind of want to put a twist on it and that's where you are going to be one and well, mano a mano with this painting to virtually stand out from the other person that you learned from or that you're trying to emulate because if you're going to sell your work you want to be a part from the her to go hold up what the hell, what's going on here um that's how you will build your brand your eye your hand your imagination as well as your work i i guarantee it because you're going to stand apart from the rest if you're painting a seascape and if, if say if i was going to paint a seascape in mountains which i i, I don't do really but if I was I'm not gonna do blues and greens and, and, and browns and mountain up I'm gonna fucking jack that stuff up to the brightest fucking colors and I'm gonna try to rock it as best I where people go what the hell happened here here's the story when I was a little boy um, they thought I was colorblind and I liked using every color crayon in the box I would just because I'm there so but um the teachers told my mother that they thought it was colorblind because I painted purple mountains I painted green dogs I painted black horses with pink tails and I remember them giving me the the colorblind test with like the the figure eight and the letter s and follow the e and you know see all the circles and again I when I look at those I always think of um Chuck Close's uh, grid paintings uh, and they were like well you're not colorblind why do you why do you paint this? like well because I, I thought if they take me out of class and have me do these tests alone I feel special so but I you know I I just I would hear songs about purple mountain majesty so I just wrote, drew purple mountains so you know I responded early on to sound and color uh, really easily and I still do um, but you know use colors that you think are going to be complementary but then fucking something that's you know artists go through the red period their blue period the gold periods they go through these phases where they look at colors and then they master the color palette of that that hue and then add different elements to that and that's what you want to do with your work another thing i would uh advise you to do have fun 
you know, you're, uh, you know, painting, painting can be work. Yes, there are days where I'm like, fuck, this painting is killing my ass, fucking up on my rhymes, and I'm just like, you know, so I put it down. And because when I'm painting, I'm working, and I have a, a structured time where I'm like, I'm working from here. I'll start painting from say like 3:30 in the afternoon. And I will stop till about 11:30. Sometimes when I'm when I'm working making art. Um, other time, you know, if when I had my dog, she would stop me. Time to go to the park. Time to feed me walkie. You know, go see my husband, my ex-husband. Um, that well, my stuff. But I always. When I was working, it was like, this is the time that I'm actually creating for to create work. And uh, a lot of the times it was fun, other times it was hard. But, you know, it fucking, you know, beat, you know, driving an Uber or, and, and nothing against driving an Uber or anything like that, but, you know, or, you know, doing DoorDash or, you know, Grubhub or, um, you know, Uber Eats and any of those, you know, Just Eat, uh, you know, all those, but, you know, there in any career, there's going to be days where it's going to be a job, and other days where it's just going to be fun. And you know, this if this is going to be your livelihood, you have to treat it like work, and it will be work some days. Um, but on the days where you're painting something that you love, you know that that's still work. But you know, you got to make your environment fun. And and I don't mean by inviting your friends over because that'll be a distraction. I saw an art YouTuber talk about, oh, it's a lonely life. I'm just like, you know, sitting in my studio alone. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's a given. Can you imagine having all your friends trying to like suck up your fucking time while you're trying to create something and try to convey a message and they're yapping away and just like, when I had a tattoo shop, I didn't even like their friends in the same room because if I was trying to converse and it was just like these two people having this conversation and I'm trying to do something here and, and focus on that and, you know, listen to music or whatever. And like, no, you know, so I made a rule. If they were regular, you know, the friend can hang out for, you know, 30 minutes and they got to go. But um, as an as a artist, I do love spending time alone and just with no distractions, just me and the piece and what I'm trying to do. And I'm like, all right, bitch, let's rock. Um, and, but then, you know, my dog comes in and like, rum, 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 rum. Uh, so yeah, um, have fun. You know, allow, trust your process. Give yourself time to learn that you're going to get there. You know, you're, uh, you know I've said it before, success is built on the foundations of failure. And at the same time, you know, just allow, give yourself some breathing space to virtually know that you can, you're going to fix this. It will. So, um, that is my, my, uh, video for anatomy of a painting. Um, you know, I hope you got some knowledge out of this. If you guys have any questions about that, um, please leave a comment down below and I will respond, respond in kindness. Um, Thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit, hit that like and subscribe button and the notification bell for updates. And uh, follow me on Instagram, uh, uh, Twitter, and all the other blah, blah, blahs, blah, 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 blah. So um, thank you for you coming and take care of yourselves and look after yourselves. All right. Bye, guys. Subscribe.